Hello, welcome to Blogging Heads. I am Bill Black. I'm a PhD candidate in history at Rice University, uh, published at uh, Vox and the Washington Post and the Atlantic. And, and I'm here talking today to David Austin Walsh. Uh, you're a PhD candidate as well, uh, also ABD in mm-hmm. history at, uh, at Princeton. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about yourself before we dive in. Uh, sure. Um, so I'm David Walsh. I'm a PhD candidate at Princeton. Um, I've been there for about four years now. Uh, before that, I was the editor at uh, the Center for History and New Media at George Mason University's uh, History News Network. I was there for about four years. Um, and so it's a website that specializes, I believe they're affiliated with, with GW now, but it's a website that specializes in the intersection of history and current events. Before that, I uh, got my BA uh, in 2011 from the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities, where I am from. All right. And you live in the D.C. area now, uh, I, Arlington? I, I do. I do. I live in the, the D.C. area. Um, I do most of my research at the, uh, at the Library of Congress, which uh, which works because, you know, I, I'm a sort of political and intellectual historian. It's a, it's a great resource, a great, great space to be working on those projects. Do you ever have to take the shuttle between uh, Library 1 and Library 2 or – Oh, I take the tunnel. They have, they they have a uh, they have a Dunkin' Donuts in the basement, so that I, you know every every morning at about eleven o'clock, it's time for my coffee break. Nice. <laughs> and then I get to go to the cafeteria where all the staffers, all the hill staffers, work uh, or eat at. Um, I always try to listen to their uh, scuttlebutt, but I never hear anything juicy. Um, I was, was going to ask you, so I guess I see a lot. Of, I, I I will say I see a lot of worried faces on the hill these days. <laughs> yeah, I, as we record, actually. I uh, probably have to resist looking at Twitter because there seems to be all sorts of stuff going on now with Mueller uh, uh, requesting stuff from the Trump organization about Russian business ties and maybe Jeff Sessions is going to get fired. Or, but you know what? We're, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm logging out of Twitter myself, but it's yeah. – it's, you know what? And I will say this, and I, I know I'm not the only academic to feel this way, um, but the – the in the excitement and the turmoil, let's use the polite terms, of the of the Trump administration has made it a little bit difficult to focus um, uh, on, on dissertating. Um, and for me, because I write about uh, conservatism in the twentieth century, uh, it can be especially yeah. distracting. But let's. But well, I guess. Perhaps, uh, I, I was going to say perhaps, perhaps perhaps this is a good segue to turn to the Trump of the nineteen sixties. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it seems to me, tell me if I'm wrong, that uh, your dissertation project is, a lot of it has to do with questioning this kind of longstanding trope that there's, you know, that there's bad conservatism, you know, that's racist and populist and xenophobic, and but then there's, you know, a, a good respect. Respectable, uh, intellectually uh, legitimate conservatism. Um, it, it, you seem to be complicating that going back to the post-war era with pe- people, uh, people like Bill Buckley and and other intellectual conservatives. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about you know what you're doing, what your project is. All right, so yeah, I was wondering if you could tell us your you know basic questions uh driving your dissertation as far as uh uh, kind of modern post-war conservatism Mm -hmm. right so um so the title of my dissertation is called um a mask for privilege of the far right and the makings of modern conservatism a mask for privilege actually was a a a book published in 1949 about anti-semitism in the united states by uh, the left-wing journalist carrie mcwilliams um and so in this dissertation, I'm, I'm trying to question the um, – re-examine the relationship between what evolves into what historians have called the new right um, in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, so which is to say the sort of conservative movement that um, the traditional story goes was started in the 1950s by uh, people like Bill Buckley and Brent Bozell – Um, And with the assistance of um, sort of grassroots activists in the 1960s, uh, gets Goldwater elected on the Republican ticket. 
or excuse me, gets Goldwater nominated on the Republican ticket. Uh, Nixon's elected in 68. Eventually it all culminates in the, in the Reagan revolution uh, of the 1980s. And um, given, given not just the events of the past um, two years with the election of Donald Trump, um, but the increasing radicalization uh, of the Republican party and specifically the conservative part of the Republican party uh, since really the, the 2000s, I, I, I became interested in, in sort of rethinking uh, in rethinking this relationship between, quote unquote, respectable conservatism um, and uh, more more radical, I suppose might be one word for it, um, uh, variations. Because up until quite recently, uh, historians generally did not. I mean, a did not look at conservatism uh, seriously. I mean, I mean, really, in the past twenty-five years, it's been a, that's been a, an innovation. The past twenty-five years of scholarship, but even even before that, even or excuse me, even after that, even after the sort of first wave of scholarship after Alan Brickley's famous nineteen ninety-five article um, in um, the Journal of American History saying we need a historiography of conservatism, not a whole lot of attention was paid to groups like the John Birch Society, for example, and their politics and their lasting influence on um, on the conservative movement. And so I just, I, I really, I, I became interested in, in sort of taking another look at that relationship. And when you read a lot of conservative journals, as I do, um, you find that there's kind of a, especially in the National Review, there's kind of a triumphalist, or was, a kind of triumphalist uh, uh, story of, oh, well, there was this problem with the kooks uh, on the fringe of the movement back in the 1950s, 1960s. And then, uh, you know, William F. Buckley and other people say no more. You know, the John Burt Society does not represent conservatism. Um, and then there's this clean break. Uh, and that's that. Um, right. But I, I think that when you really look at, um, when you really look at the, uh, What's going on at the time in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s? It's not so much a question of there's a group of people who are a uh, a bunch of kooks, um, you know, the John Birch Society and people more extreme, in some cases more explicitly sort of fascist sympathizers. Um, it, it's more a question of who is going to be in the driver's seat of this thing called conservatism and there are all sorts of different competing conservatisms um for that uh sort of preeminent position and the uh the national review crowd the sort of uh anti-communist uh limited government free markets uh conservatives which i mean evolves into what you know we would now call neoliberalism win out um but that doesn't mean that these other groups go away um, and I think what right. we're seeing, and I think what we're seeing now is the reassertion of some very different kinds of conservative traditions, um, in the past five to 10 years. Um, and I think that, um, I think that's arguably where Donald Trump comes from. Um, so, I mean, I guess one way to put it would be that the National Review crowd won, they won the claim in the sort of mainstream discourse mm-hmm. to be the sp- who define conservatism, but they didn't necessarily win over the majority of Americans who, who, you know, who were their political compatriots. Uh, I think that's, I I think that's true. And I think they were aware of that um, in the 1950s and 1960s um, that their particular brand of politics did not necessarily command a great deal of, electoral support this was always a problem for them and i think when we watch the wallace clips we'll we'll see this play out um you know, the other thing i would say is that in some respects and this is one of the arguments i make in my in my dissertation in some respects some of the fundamental assumptions of say the birchers or um as i say some people who are more extreme um more explicitly uh White nationalist was what we would say now, or like uh, like George Lincoln Rockwell, people like that. Or? 
Yeah, those and, and Rockwell, we can maybe bracket him for another another okay. conversation. He's very much the Milo <laughs> Yiannopoulos of his day. Right. Um, but uh, in in some respects, we're we're dealing with um, a, a lot of these a lot of these groups, a lot of these individuals, a lot of these movements had some of the same basic assumptions about um, race, politics, and culture. Um, they play out in different ways, but but um, and, and I think we'll see this in the Wallace clips too. Um, but there's there's actually a lot of agreement and overlap um, okay. between these groups as well. Well, and I, I suppose, that, and this is sort of an experiment here, at Blogging Heads. But uh, the 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 reason I, I first thought about asking you to come on was because you live tweeted. If I guess <laughs> if if you can live tweet something that was uh, televised 50 years ago. Uh, you, uh, what you live tweeted your viewing, which did indeed happen live, of uh, George Wallace's appearance on Firing Lane, William F. Buckley's uh, talk show. Is that it was it was his show, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was on PBS. I it was um, I think it was on PBS for its entire run. So I mean, it, but from 1966 through 98. William F. Buckley was on PBS every week or every couple of weeks with a new guest. And just, I mean, it's, it's astonishing the number of different people he had on over the course of his career. Um, uh, Noam Chomsky, he debated Noam Chomsky in Vietnam in 1969. He had revolutionaries, he had Eldridge Cleaver, he had Ann Coulter towards the end of his run um, in 98 to talk about the Clinton impeachment. So it's uh, yeah. it's, it's a resource that I think um, uh and, and because most of it is now on on YouTube, thanks to the uh, work of the Hoover Institution, um, it's it's an untapped resource, I think, for uh, a lot of historians uh, to just oh. go and watch old Iron Line episodes. I guess here's a quick question: Do you think that your average American, if it knew of Buckley, really through that show rather than the National Review? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I'm glad you asked that question because it's a point I wanted to make. Um, you know, when you watch a lot of Firing Line episodes, uh, particularly uh, the earlier ones from the 1960s. Um, it, it's, it's Buckley and, and the conservative movement speaking to a, a l- much larger audience than they would get through the pages of National Review or other conservative magazines. Um, and in, in fact, you know, they won't he won't necessarily make some of the um, some of the same claims as either he or other people in National Review did about specific issues um, and, and we can get into this in the again, yeah. this this pops up in the Wallace bit. Um, but when in, when in 1968 is this? Is this uh, very early? In, I believe it's January 24, 1968. So, okay. So Wallace is running for he's running for president uh, uh, under the under the American Independence Party or some third party, right? At that, at that point. Yeah. At that point, um, Wallace is seriously considering a so 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 some so, uh, excuse me. For some context about wa- where Wallace is coming from and the relationship between Buckley and Wallace for these series of clips. Yeah. So Wallace um, obviously comes to national attention in the early 1960s as the segregationist governor of Alabama, segregation now, segregation forever, uh, etc. Um, he sues the um, uh, he sues the federal government on a couple of different occasions to overturn uh, desegregation orders. Um, I, I believe he. Uh, uh, calls for Earl Warren's impeachment, um, does all does all sorts of things that, that uh, uh, generate headlines. In fact, he's reasonably favor- favorably covered in the National Review in the early 1960s for some of these actions because they're also against federal overreach. Um, but so Wallace runs uh, for the Democratic nomination in 1964 um, and does surprisingly well in some northern states, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, and uh, by 1966, 1967, he's generating a lot of headlines speculating, well, will he challenge Johnson again uh, for the Democratic nomination in 68? Or maybe he'll run as an independent and he fans his speculation himself. Um, the National Review starts covering Wallace uh, seriously as a, as a potential presidential candidate in 1967, a little bit in 1966. Um, and the tone of their coverage, and they were a little bit skeptical of him, but they were generally on board with his anti, uh, anti-federal measures. Um, but the tone of coverage becomes quite considerably more skeptical, frankly, somewhat harsh. And in fact, he's profiled by um, 
Oh, the name escapes me at the moment. But he's profiled by a prominent um, conservative writer who was um, a one-time uh, newspaper editor in Virginia, um, who was uh, ironically also a segregationist before he recanted those views um, in 1967. And that review or that that um, uh, profile of Wallace is actually quite negative. It kind of presents him as a uh, as an unhinged rube, um, and that obviously uh, irritated Wallace. Um, and it yeah. irritated a lot of National Review readers. They got a lot of hate mail for um, hmm. for that profile. So that's that's kind of I'm, I'm trying to set the stakes of this encounter in '68. It's a major it's a major TV appearance for Wallace. Um, Wallace is running as a conservative. He's claimed he's he's um, literally claiming the mantle of conservatism, saying I'm the conservative candidate in this race. Um, so it's a way to engage with Buckley's followers, or at least people who are familiar with with his work and um, sort of movement conservatism as, exi- as it exists in 1968. I mean, really what he's trying to do is trying to court people who would vote for Reagan if he were running on the Republican ticket. But, yeah. you know, wh- whether or not Reagan gets the nomination is an open question in, in January. So that's what Wallace is trying to do. Buckley is trying, I think, to um, trying to protect his movement um, from... Uh, being co-opted by by Wallace, um, yeah. so so I, so that's the stakes of this of this um, uh, of this debate, this confrontation, and it makes yeah. great television. It is definitely. Uh, there's a lot of uh, yelling and interrupting and laughing. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to start with the a clip where uh, kind of early in the conversation, and Wallace challenges. Um, Wallace challenges uh, Buckley to, you know, criticize, to tell a policy of his that he disagrees with that I think starts to open up um, the debate over whether or not Wallace can call himself a conservative, who gets to decide who is a conservative. So. Exactly right. Name one thing in Alabama that I have supported on the governmental level that you are against. Well, it, <clears throat> it seems to me that... Uh... Uh, your, your, uh, if I may say so, fanatical concern for using public money for uh, certain functions what, what that name might that otherwise. Function? Well, for instance, you you want to take care of the hospitalization. You want to take care of old people. You want to take care of the poor. Are you against uh, caring for the poor? Uh, uh, I had a old? feeling that you would answer that that way. Are you against I hate the, the poor? I want. <laughs> I'm for shooting them. So. That, that's what I thought. No. no, my point is that this is a, a free enterprise country. Uh, and that uh, uh, we have a tradition here of private philanthropy, uh, of philanthropy conducted by, by private people and uh, under programs that haven't required the mobilization of the machinery uh, of the state, whether uh, at the federal or at the local level. That under the circumstances, the whole tradition of your kind of Democrat uh, is one of enormous enthusiasm uh, for federal handouts. In May I answer that? Yes. May I, 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 I answer yeah. You've had enough time. Like, mm-hmm. like Governor Wallace. In the first place, in Alabama, we have the highest old age pensions for destitute in our state mm-hmm. that we find in most any southern state. That is, for people, the average age is 70 years of age. 3% of them are over 90. Mm-hmm. They're destitute. They're not people who uh, have incomes. I'm for that myself. Yeah, for what? It, uh, for caring for destitute well, average I, I, age of I'm 70 too. years it's, old. It's a question whether it has to be done 90. by the government. Uh, oh, well, it has to be, in this instance, done by the government. Why? For the simple reason why that... Why can't it be uh, done by their children? Well, uh, that's, uh, uh, it just so happens well, that... Well, Alabamans uh, don't take care of their parents? Well, you have this program in New York, too. Mm-hmm. You have it throughout the country. It's not that children don't take care of their parents. We have many elderly people in our state and in every state who need help. Uh, who have reached the age of 70, the average in Alabama drawing old age pension. So let me say this, if there's no use, we're not going to reconcile our differences there. I am for looking after destitute elderly people. I am for looking, yes, I'm for that. I'm not against that at all. So if conservatism is against looking after the elderly who are destitute, I might say that no conservative in this country who comes out against looking after destitute elderly people ought to be elected to anything. All right. So th- that's quite a statement Wallace makes there as far as <laughs> any conservative who doesn't want to take care of the, of the destitute and the elderly uh, shouldn't be elected to office. Well, what do you make of that? Well, I mean, you know, this is 
This was Buckley's uh, major line of attack against Wallace, both throughout the debate and in his own writings and in the writings of other people in the National Review, that Wallace can't be a real conservative um, because he supported aspects of the New Deal welfare state. Um, you know, and he makes the point, uh, Buckley makes the point throughout the interview, oh, well, you know, Governor Wallace was a great admirer of Franklin Roosevelt when he was alive. Um, he accepted federal money um, for, uh, you know, various projects in the state, including, of course, horribly, uh, care for uh, the elderly in Alabama. Um, you know, I, I, what I find interesting, and I, I, wrote, I wrote about this on Twitter um, when I first watched this clip, um, but what I found the most interesting about this is that, uh, of course, George Wallace is not the only politician to be accepting federal dollars for the benefit of his constituents. Um, you know, throughout the South, of course, this is this is something that happens across the North as well. Um, but what I find really interesting here is that this also happens in the Sun Belt, and there's been a lot of really great scholarship on this over the past uh, 20 years or so. Uh, but in Southern California, uh, which is Ronald Reagan's stomping grounds, as well as Richard Nixon's in Arizona, uh, which of course Barry Goldwater represents in the Senate, there's a lot of federal dollars coming into these states. Um, for, among other things, defense contracts, um, which is, I mean, something that Buckley um, and other conservatives uh, at the National Review and elsewhere are big proponents of, uh, big proponents right. of the military buildup um, uh, to protect us from uh, international communism. Uh, and so it, it, it just, it, it struck me as a, you know, Buckley, you know, he, uh, you know, he, I, 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 I admit I laugh. It's my favorite part of the uh, the whole um the whole interview when he said, I hate the poor. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and obviously he's being sarcastic. And I don't think that, um, I, I mean, I don't think that, you know, that's true, obviously, uh, in, in an abstract sense. But it, it does strike me as, as interesting yeah. that the litmus test, um, the, the apparent litmus test, I mean, if we're applying a sort of consistent standard here, is not federal dollars per se as a marker of whether or not one is considered accepting federal dollars, but accepting federal dollars for um, specific purposes. So economic development is fine, apparently, uh, based on what's happening in the Sun Belt. Um, but the kind of direct social services um, are not. Um, of, of course, the problem is uh, that uh, those social service programs are, are quite popular. And, and Wallace makes this point over and over again in the um, it, uh, throughout the interview um, that the people of Alabama, um, I mean, certainly his white constituents, um, like those social programs. Um, uh, although what's, what's also interesting, I don't know if we're going to see this part of the clip, but um, Wallace is sufficiently concerned at this point in the campaign to sort of distance himself from explicitly racist uh, credentials. He makes the point that um, a number of the uh, uh, beneficiaries, and I, I don't know if this is actually true. I, I haven't uh, looked into this. He claims that a number of the beneficiaries of the of these programs are African Americans. Um, so he, tout, he touts the, the number of black people who voted for him uh, as governor, and, and who voted for his wife, who who ran for governor in '66 when he could yeah I, yeah actually I mean I mean we should we should mention that because this is another point that that uh, comes up. Um, uh, in this in this discussion uh, on firing line, uh, George Wallace is not the governor of Alabama in 1968. His wife Lurleen is because he uh, ran up against term limits, um, and it's actually something that Buckley talks about as an, as evidence of uh, Wallace's sort of uh, southern uh, southern style, you know, Huey Long style, I suppose would be the word yeah. phrase, corruption. Um, well, let me play. Here's a, another short clip that. that goes back to this question of who gets to call Wallace, who, who gets to call themselves a conservative. And actually, there's a few short clips where this question comes up again and again. We'll look at them and then dissect it all. So here's one. We have, we have got it. Let's get it from definitely from Governor Wallace, whether he is a conservative or pretends what, to be a conservative. What, well, now, listen, let's get he's, back. He calls himself a populist. Let's get back. What well, what, if, you, if you mean the populist, if you mean the... If you mean uh, uh, man of the people, yes, I'm a populist, if that's what you mean by it. I don't know what you mean by populist, because you have many definitions of many you. things. But I, I'll say that uh, uh, insofar, let's get back to the old age pension. Let, let, you, you, you don't, you're against Alabama's looking after the elderly, destitute citizens of the state. <laughs> yeah, we proved that, haven't we? I'm Governor, for Governor, we're trying to get to the question of whether you regard yourself that. as a conservative. 
Do, oh, yeah, do well, it. Do, do, do you attach that label what, to What do you mean by conservative? You give your own definition. You're, well, you're, my, you're speaking. conservative to me means that we should allow uh, on the uh, governmental scene to allow local people uh, to try to determine policies of local democratic institutions. Well, how can they without the vote? Uh, without what? The vote. The vote. V-O-T-E. Well, what, what steps did you take to encourage the enfranchisement of the Negro back well, I've, before I've the government got well, on your back? Well, I'll, I'll be glad to tell you, I've always made speeches in my state in which I said anybody's entitled to vote regardless of their race or color, uh, uh, qualified under the laws of Alabama, and we had Negro citizens by the thousands who voted in 1958 when I first ran for governor, and I might say it in the runoff for governor, that they voted for me. And well, that, I, is that because they didn't have the education you're talking about? No, I didn't say that. They, they voted for me because they didn't have education. Well, you reflect on the Negro voters of Alabama if you want to, but I don't. They exercised uh, their choice, and their choice was as good as the choice. What, what I think is, is of great national interest is, how will Mr. Wallace do in 1968? And the answer is, of course, that he's appealing to people to whom Mr. Goldwater appealed, Mr. Reagan appealed, but I think he's appealing to them as an imposter, because I think that Mr. Wallace's principal uh, a franchise comes from people who are concerned over well, this issue. Well, let me say that I enjoy... You think he's an imposter because you think basically <clears throat> his issue is the... Race. I think I he's, enjoy, using, he's using the rhetoric of conservatism I enjoy being on purposes. programs. Now, you say, let people decide what you are uh, on their own, but I say... You are using the rhetoric of conservatism for illicit well, anything you want to say. Yeah. Uh, you have <clears> been <throat> the attitude in the National Review, Mr. Buckley, that anyone who doesn't agree with you is not a conservative. No. That I am the messiah of the conservative no. cause. No. Yes, you have, because and that's your general <clears throat> reputation throughat the United States. National and Review. If you has... don't agree with you, then that makes you a flaming liberal, and that makes you. Uh, uh, not correct, but I want you to know that you aren't the fountainhead of conservatism. No, I didn't say what. In, in fact, fact, I have more support I, I, right I, now in the country I, than I, you do. I, I can't find that. Are you are you the fountainhead of conservatism? No, certainly not. I <laughs> I can't think of a single editor of National Review, and there are seven of them who agrees with me on everything. All right, so there's a whole lot going on there. Yeah. Um, I guess. Uh, why, why, why do you think? Buckley wants to call Wallace a populist rather than a conservative. And indeed, to, to say that Wallace is an imposter, trying to use the, he says, the rhetoric of conservatism for uh, anti-conservative uh, purposes. What's, what, what, what's he tr really saying there? Right. I mean, I think what he's trying to, I, 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 I think that that statement comes from a, Place that argument that Buckley's making there about about him being an you know imposter to the conservative movement um, is a he's trying to um, he's trying to distance conservatism from crudity. I think is 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 what's happening there. Um, you know, if, if we take Buckley at his word, and I, I, I think we should, that he is adamantly opposed to the kinds of social uh, programs that uh, Wallace instituted as governor in Alabama, adamantly opposed to the kind of Keynesian economics that, uh, uh, and then the, simply the New Deal that Wallace and a lot of other Southern, white Southern Democrats uh, had, um, you know, then you can kind of see Buckley's concern um, that, well, this is a group of politicians who aren't actually as committed to the issues that I am the most fundamentally committed to. And if you read National Review or other conservative magazines, that that is, that is pretty consistently the hostility to the New Deal state is pretty consistently the uh, sort of binding glue um, that keeps this movement together. You know, what Wallace is doing is he is using the language of that um, – you know, through his, uh, he's using the language that, of, of uh, the sort of anti-statist language that was pioneered, um, well, the pioneer is perhaps too strong a claim, but um, that was popularized in that political moment by people like Buckley and by Ronald Reagan, um, and focusing it on um, state power being used uh, to dismantle the segregation of state in the South. Um, and I think that this, I think that this scares um, Buckley and a lot of other um, prominent conservatives uh, in the late 1960s. Why? Uh, well, I think because they've already seen the extent to which the political popularity of conservatism um, is based on um, – 
is based on a kind of politics that they, that, that sort of conservative elite conservatives um, have, have tried to, have tried to sort of unsuccessfully both play footsie with and distance themselves from. And so I'm thinking about the John Burke Society in particular, um, which is still around in 1968. Uh, you know, Buckley started, uh, wrote an article in, I believe, 1965, uh, sort of castigating uh, the Birchers and uh, Robert Welch, the, the founder of the John Burke Society, as uh, unhinged. Um, but, uh, you, know, you know, it's still a, a mass organization. So it's maybe 100,000 uh, uh, members um, in 1968. Uh, and, you know, Buckley, <laughs> and I, I, I wish um, we can go back and edit this in, but there's, there's a clip of uh, Buckley and Wallace uh, from earlier in this debate kind of going at each other. And, and uh, Wallace is saying to Buckley, you only got 12 percent of the vote when you ran for mayor of New York City as a conservative in 1965. And I, I get more than that in Alabama, not even trying. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think I think Buckley is scared. And I think a lot of conservatives, a lot of leading conservatives are concerned um, because, uh, because the, the kind of aggressive anti-statist and also more or less explicitly racist conservatism, uh, well, if, w- w- however you want to label it, w- um, Wallace's sort of aggressively anti-statist, uh, and racist politics are actually quite, um, politically potent. And, and there's something else that I think is worth, is worth discussing, um, that, uh, it, it's also a question of, tone and temperament as much as it is actual policies. Uh, a civil rights Buckley also opposes that. He says in a later program, d- debating a Wallace supporter, you know, I think that it only got passed because of the assassination of Martin Luther King and, you know, more time should have been required to, uh, to, to pass such a overreaching bill. Um, so there's that sort of fundamental kernel of similarity. They're arguing for, essentially the same policies at the federal level, uh, but with just different inflection points. And, you know, and, and you can see, even see at the state level, the way Ronald Reagan is governor of California um, is, I mean, it's, it's certainly not the same as segregationist Alabama, um, but Ronald Reagan is, is making similar types of appeals to conservatives through his own um, aggressive actions against uh, the free speech activists at Berkeley and the Black Panther Party, um, so how does Buckley feel about Reagan? Oh, he loves Ronald Reagan. Um, so, so his objection to Wallace, I mean, that he's afraid that someone like Wallace can take what has made conservative politics successful, but actually sort of eschew uh, a lot of the anti New Deal principles that Buckley finds important. And I think that's true. I think that's true. And I also want to jump in here and add that. Remember also that in 1968, the conservative takeover of the Republican Party is by no means complete. I mean, the um, the nominees haven't been picked yet um, at this point in 1968. So Ronald Reagan is running for governor or excuse me, Ronald Reagan is running for president. So is Richard Nixon. But so is Nelson Rockefeller. Um, and so, you know, it, it's really not for another 20 years uh, until you see the end of sort of Eisenhower, Rockefeller, Republicanism as a, I mean, it's it sort of no longer is dominant um, after Nixon, um, but it's still part of the party as late as the 1980s, uh, you know, in a way that's difficult to imagine today. And remember, this is, this is what Buckley and a lot of other conservatives were organizing against um, in the 1950s. They saw this as um, the wrong direction for the Republican Party, um, in 1952, I believe Buckley preferred Taft, uh, Robert Taft, the uh, senator from Ohio, over uh, Dwight Eisenhower as the Republican nominee, and he was sympathetic to Joseph McCarthy. Um, and and so Wallace and other Southern Democrats like him um, do represent a kind of they represent a, uh, they represent a threat to this uh, movement that is just beginning to sort of exercise its power and muscle within the Republican party um, by presenting, I mean, I mean really one of the things that, that Buckley is concerned about, this doesn't really come out in the clip, um, but is the possibility of 
the Democratic Party at the national level uh, embracing a more pro Wallace direction because that could split mm-hmm. the conservative vote between the two parties. Um, so, as I said, I mean, I mean, Wallace is a disruptive force, I, I, I think, for conservatives in 1968. And that's why there's such concern. Um, and it's one of the reasons why there's kind of a sigh of relief, um, uh, at least in the National Review circles, when Richard Nixon becomes uh, the uh, nominee, because, you know, he's tricky dick. He, he was Eisenhower's VP. He's not a reliable conservative. Um but he's not a liberal either, and and that's and that's enough in in '68 to kind of keep the movement together. Um, whereas you know, and, and then the Wallace uh, supporters tend to be um, disaffected Democrats. The John Birch Society goes all in for Wallace. One of the things that I think uh, William F. Buckley prided himself on was acting as and and you know it, it, it's. <laughs> Wallace brings this up in the clip, actually. I mean, did anybody who disagrees with you is not a conservative? Buckley goes, oh, well, of course not. But I actually think uh, Buckley relished that role. He really enjoyed playing the sort of umpire of the conservative movement, um, of, or of his conservative movement, and and uh, sort of determining who was and who was not uh, acceptably, um, acceptably uh, conservative enough or, uh, you know, in many cases, whether or not somebody was too explicitly racist or anti-Semitic to, to um, be part of uh, be part of the conservative movement. Um, but like I said, what I find interesting is that this is only this clip is only 11 years after Buckley's famous infamous uh, 1957 editorial in National Review, Why the South Must Prevail, uh, in which he says something to the effect of and I'm paraphrasing um, that um, Anglo-Saxon civilization, uh, superior Anglo-Saxon civilization in the South must be defended at all costs. Um, and it's only a few years after, um, again, some rather favorable coverage of Wallace um, for taking the federal government to task for uh, desegregation orders appeared in, appeared in National Review. Um, so is it really only when Wallace becomes a more national political figure, someone who might actually change the shape of of American conservatism that uh, the National Review folks get alarmed. Is that fair? I think that's I think that's right. Um, you know, as long as he's as long as Wallace is just in the South and he's kind of a thorn in the side of Northern liberals, then he is yeah. um, he's a potential ally. Quite frankly, I mean, he's he's a buffoonish um, and not somebody who can be completely relied upon. But he is a he is a potential ally, and um, with the same. You know, the writers in the National Review share some of the same basic concerns about uh, Wallace, about you know the size and scope of the federal government. Um, uh, of course, when Wallace and, and this is the thing about Southern um, Southern Democrats um, from the 1930s through and really until the end of the Southern Democrats, a sort of a political phenomenon in the 1980s, is an opposition to federal power insofar as federal power threatens. You know, states' rights, which is to say, uh, the segregation of state in the South, and so that's the reason why, you know, you have uh, people like John Rankin and other um, other uh, Southern congressional Democrats um, forming part of that conservative coalition in the 1930s to um, sort of rein in uh, Roosevelt during his second term. Um, why the New Deal is designed the way that it is that emphasizes sort of local control. Um, you know, that was done to buy Southern votes um, because they wanted to Southern Southern Democrats wanted to be able to discriminate against African Americans, uh, essentially. Um, and so. You can see the commonality there, which is this sort of skepticism of federal power and the potential for alliances and even some si- similar basic assumptions about um, race and civilization even if the National Review crowd is much less comfortable being explicitly racist. And, and in mm-hmm. fact, they begin to moderate those, uh, uh, moderate the statements about, um, uh, I mean, I mean, Buckley uh, walks away from, uh, uh, Buckley distances himself from the uh, Why the South Must Prevail op-ed um, throughout the 1960s. Um, but there is that, there is that sort of, in a core that that concern about maintaining the order as is constituted um, both in the south and and across the country um, 
uh, so they, they want to have their cake and eat it too, so to speak. They there is plenty of, gr- of agreement, and yet I don't know. I, I guess I just wonder how much of this has to do with just establishment conservatives conservatives wanting to still be allowed in polite company in New York and DC and uh, to, to be respected, you know, public intellectuals, uh, uh, you know, to be on PBS and, and to, 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 to not be, you know, uh, uh, lumped in with uh, racists and bigots and how much of this has to do with prestige and ego. Well, I think a tremendous amount. Um, and I'd, I'd add on top of that that I think one of the reasons why um, Buckley finds uh, Wallace in particular to be so objectionable is, I mean, Buckley's a snob. I mean, he, he's a, uh, uh, a patrician. He's the, uh, I mean, actually his, his family is uh, uh, from the South originally, if I recall correctly. His grand, he mentions this in the uh, debate with Wallace that his grandfather, great-grandfather served in the Confederate Army in the Civil War. But, you know, of course, Buckley, you know, is a product of Yale, um, lives in New York, uh, he's, he's an avid yachter. Uh, I've, I've worked in the Buckley papers before and he's got an entire folder in there, uh, just about his yacht. <laughs> uh, and so it's, you know, he, he represents a very different kind of class politics than, uh, you know, somebody like Wallace who, uh, is, who comes from a very different background, uh, much more yeah. similar to Huey Long or Lyndon Johnson, so, sort of poor Southern uh, white background. Um, so I think, and, and so when Buckley calls Wallace a populist, I mean, it's, it's really a, uh, I mean, it's really a term of, of loathing, um, as, as Buckley uses it, but, uh, and so loaded with class implications. It is. I mean, who the populace is. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if Buckley had been living in the 19 or in the 1890s, uh, he would have, he would have been a mugwump, right. Or, um, some other, uh, Eastern equivalent thereof, but he would not have been a fan of the. Uh, populist party in the 1890s. Uh, he was not a fan of the New Deal for, uh, I think, similar reasons. So there's there's a there's an elitism to Buckley that can be. I, I mean, certainly on firing line, it, it can be charming, especially to sort of see it as unvarnished as it is in the um, in the um, in the in this debate with Wallace. But but that's where I think a lot of it a lot of it comes from. Um, here's a well. Here's a. Uh... A bigger question then, because uh, I'm sure our listeners and, and viewers have, have been thinking, you know, how the relationship between Buckley and other intellectual conservatives and George Wallace and the John Birch Society, how that is similar or different to the, the relationship that movement conservatives today have with Donald Trump. Uh, okay. As, as far as I don't know, I mean, when I, when I hear debates over whether or not Trump is actually conservative, I'm reminded a lot of uh, of, of, of what Buckley's saying about Wallace. Um, I, 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 go ahead. I mean, I, I I absolutely agree. I think the fundamental distinction between the two is that Buckley was able, to, Buckley and other conservatives, other well, uh, other movement conservatives like him were able to maintain control of the conservative movement, and they were not in 2016. Um, you know, conservatism is now Trumpism. Um, and I think that, uh, and, and I think that there was that possibility, uh, in 1968. Um, you know, lest we forget Richard Nixon wins, uh, running a campaign that could be, you know, charitably described as sort of Wallace light. I mean, law and order is a big, um, is, is it one of his big talking points? His campaign ads are actually, uh, very similar to Wallace's in that regard. He has somewhat similar stance on Vietnam. Um, and in, in 1960, and I, in fact, when I was thinking about 2016, uh, compared to 1968 election, what's interesting is that in 1968, uh, or in, well, in 2016, you have, what was it, 46% of the electorate vote for Hillary Clinton, roughly 43 for Donald Trump. There's about a two point difference, three point difference. Um, in 1968, 57% of voters vote for either Richard Nixon or George Wallace. Um, so there's there's a sort of openness to the kind of conservative populism, let's call it that, uh, 
um, that Wallace represents and that Nixon taps into that I think really concerns um, Buckley and other conservative intellectuals. And, and intellectual historians have made this point, but George Hawley has made this point in, um, in some of his books. He's a political scientist at the University of Alabama that uh, intellectual conservatives like, like Buckley and Russell Kirk and Frank Meyer were never really able to reconcile a contradiction that was really evident in 1968 and pops up again uh, throughout the history of the history of American conservatism, that um, a lot of their ideas are not about free enterprise and the free market and whatnot, are actually not all that popular with conservative voters. What's popular with conservative voters is traditionalism, it's racial hierarchy, it's religion, um, you know, variously constituted, constituted. And, um, they were never able to, they were never able to sort of reconcile this. That's why when we, that's why when historians talk about uh, the history of American conservatism, what's really been sort of the emphasis of the past 10, 15 years has been different constitutive elements of the, uh, conservative coalition. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess it's the question of, did it's a question of whether it was it you know to say that conservatism is trumpism the question is was it actually trumpism all along it's just that there wasn't a candidate who was able or willing to really tap into it fully i i guess it's just it's funny when when you well, think I- of of the of the autopsy after 2012 you know, what, what the mm-hmm. Republican establishment thought the party needed to do to win in 2016. It was f- almost the, the opposite of what Trump did, right? I mean, it was essentially a, a Buckleyite, you know, I, move of trying to purge itself even more of anti-immigration, you know, politics and, and, and culture war issues. And, and yet, honestly, I think that that wouldn't have worked. I don't think a you know, a Marco Rubio or whatever was going to be able to win. I think pretty much the, the Trumpist uh, uh, line is, is the only way now that a Republican can take the White House. Um, I mean, I think that I, I think that's certainly true now, although I think there are limits to that brand. Of, I mean, we just saw the uh, special election in Pennsylvania. There are limits to not. And I live in Virginia. I saw this with uh, Ralph Northam and yeah. uh, what's his name? Gillespie uh, last year. Um, the, but, but, but I, I think your broader point is, is correct, that there has been a, uh, a large part of the sort of conservative coalition that has been uh, craving a candidate like, like Trump, uh, like George Wallace, uh, in 1968, uh, for quite some time. And if I, let me, let me brief aside, I'll, I'll tell a yeah. little story here that I think illustrates this. And Ed Buckley is involved in this as well. Uh, and it will, I think, illustrate that, even though there is a difference between the kind of, you know, intellectual conservatives like Buckley and the NR set um, and uh, conservative populists, uh, it's a di- it's a difference that can be often sort of indistinct. Um, so obviously the other the other major Trump like candidate that came out of conservative circles uh, between 68 and 2016 was Pat Buchanan in 1992 and um, Buchanan has said uh, recently that Donald Trump basically stole his pl- uh, campaign playbook, and I, I actually agree with Buchanan on that. Uh, and Buchanan gets a relatively relatively small amount of the um, Republican vote uh, in 92 uh, when he challenges Bush for the nomination. But he still gets about 25 percent. So we're talking several million voters um, for a relatively popular Republican president. I mean, again, the only reason why um, – the only reason why Clinton wins in the first place is because of Perot and the sort of defections therein. Um, but within his party, he's relatively popular. He gets still about 40 percent of the vote. Um, and Clinton only gets 43. Uh, and so, you know, that indicates to me that in the early 90s, at least, but you see this in the 1960s and again in 2016. So that suggests there's a longer story going on here. Yeah. Um, that there's a particular breed of conservative voter that is very responsive to kind of populist and often rather authoritarian appeals. And, you know, Buchanan uh, does his campaign 
um, and managed to secure the keynote speech in the 92, the famous culture war speech, where it's very loaded with political invective against the Clintons, very, very divisive, very dark, very similar to Trump's speeches in 2016. Um, and Buchanan does all of this uh, less than two years after he is raked over the coals um, for publishing an article, I think it was in the New York Post, in which he defends a Nazi war criminal and questions whether or not 800,000 Jews were really gassed at Treblinka. Um, I didn't realize he went the Holocaust denial. Uh, yeah, no, no, I mean, he never he never explicitly embraced it, but he's flirted with it. And, um, yeah. you know, it taps into a sort of longer paleoconservative tradition. You can go back to the 1930s and see the roots of this, the some sympathy towards uh, Nazi Germany um, intermingled with anti-war sentiment. Um, and a questioning of whether or not it was really you know, necessary to fight in World War II. Um, Buchanan's written some subsequent books about this, which have argued that uh, the Poles actually started World War II, and Winston Churchill is a is a warmonger, which is exactly what Gerald L. K. Smith was saying during World War II, and saying, "Oh, the Nazis aren't so bad." Um, and then you know we can bracket all of that for uh, a, another discussion because I think that that's um, what's a discussion worth having. But where Buckley comes in on this now, he writes a book in 1992 uh, called In Search of Antisemitism. And part of it is about the Buchanan phenomenon. But part of it is also about how he had to fire one of his um, one of his columnists, a man named Joseph Braun, um, for uh, repeatedly making anti-Semitic statements and, you know, being very, I think he insinuated that Israel controls American foreign policy and things like this. Um, and, and, and he was one of Buckley's cr- close protégés in the 1980s. Um, and, and so, and this is, was not the first time that Buckley had to do this at National Review in the late 1950s. Um, he had to, um, he instituted a policy where nobody who appeared, uh, in the American Mercury, which was, um, by then a sort of anti-Semitic rag, um, could appear in, uh, in the National Review. Um, and he actually had to cut loose a couple of people he was close to, um, in doing so. And, you know, I, I think there's something, I'll bring in Richard Spencer here, um, of all people, because he wrote a book um, a few years ago uh, with uh, several other sort of far right uh, intellectuals, um, which it's called The Great Purge. The uh, And it's basically all about how much he hates William F. Buckley. And the reason is and the reason is, is that um, he feels like his. His, his fellow travelers, his, his inspiration to you know, become a Nazi, uh, were unfairly forced out of the conservative movement um, by Buckley and other sort of gatekeepers uh, at August magazines like National Review and, um, and elsewhere. And of course, he also doesn't, isn't overly fond of neoconservatives who are you know, too, too globalist for him. Um, but uh, you know, the reason I bring all of this up is that if you've got somebody like Buchanan who – um, comes out of a, a somewhat different uh, conservative tradition, still very much a conservative tradition, but not National Review style sort of Cold War conservatism, but sort of more isolationist conservatism from the 1930s, and 1940s. Um, and you've got him flirting with Holocaust and all of that. And then you've got somebody at National Review basically doing the same thing. Um, it suggests that there's not a there's not a clean dividing line between these two um these two different types of conservatism. And, and that, again, this is the whole point of my, um, uh, what, what I'm trying to argue with the dissertation, that these distinct categories and groupings don't necessarily, don't necessarily stand up to intense scrutiny. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but what I think does stand up, and why I, what I think the purpose here is, uh, which is why I call the dissertation I borrowed Mick Williams title a mask for privilege is that all of this is ultimately about, and you know, this borrows uh, heavily on Corey uh, influenced, I should say heavily by Corey Robbins work as well, that it's fundamentally about the preservation of existing hierarchies. Um, and that means that people who are committed to a particular vision of society in say the American South, which is uh which is concerned about federal intervention to dismantle the segregationist state can make common cause and find alliances um, with say people like Barry Goldwater who are opposed to the civil rights act for essentially the same reasons, but not because they're explicitly concerned with defending segregation. Hmm. And how do you today 
what do you make today of this, the struggle to to define conservatism? I mean, I guess I'm saying, who are the gatekeepers and how successful are they being at defining conservatism, you think? I think they're doing I, I think they're not capable of, do, of doing that anymore, to be completely honest. I, I read an interesting column um, by uh, David Roberts at Vox um, the other day, and he wrote that uh, if the New York Times um, was really interested in presenting a representative view of American conservatism through its conservative columnist, and now they have Brett Stevens, Russ Dutta, Barry Weiss, um, they should ax them because they don't actually have a, a meaningful constituency among Republican voters and replace them with um, popular conservative columnists. So that would mean everybody from Eric Erickson to, um, although his, actually his stock has declined recently, to uh, Ben Shapiro to some of the stable over at the Federalist to, you know, more explicitly uh, out and out racist or um, extreme views, Tammy Lahren, for example. Um, so I, that, I think, that would give people a more accurate uh, idea of what a very large number of Americans believe than someone like Brett Stevens or yeah. I, 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 what do you think's changed there? Is it just the the infrastructure of of the various magazines or or? Well, I mean, it's it's an interesting question. I mean, I think that um, you know N- Nicole Hammer wrote a, a brilliant book called Messengers of the Right. It was published about two years ago, um, which uh, was about the development of conservative talk radio in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. Um, and she made the point, which, which I think is true, that um, at least in terms of audience share, uh, Buckley isn't all that important. Um, hmm. You know, I, the, uh, you know, things change a bit with firing line. Uh, but in terms of actual listeners, um, it's people like Clarence Mannion. Uh, Fulton Lewis, uh, who was uh, active in the early 1950s, a big defender of Joseph McCarthy, and I write about him uh, a bit in my dissertation. Um, but they command large audiences. We're talking about 15, uh, 20 million people, um, hundreds I've of people. I've never even heard of him. Yeah. Sorry, and so, um, and, and so I'm, I'm less convinced that it's just a question of, oh, you know, people like Rush Limbaugh have. Uh, large audiences, because that's always been the case. Um, Coughlin, whether or not you want to put him in the conservative category or wherever you want to put him in the 1930s, another example of somebody with a very, very large uh, mass media audience. Um, but what I think has changed is um, what I think has changed has been the impact of the Internet on the business models of um, of sort of august institutions like National Review. And, you know, you see this on the other side with the, or not the other side, but you see this with liberal magazines too, like the New Republic or left-wing magazines like The Nation, that it it makes it much harder to monetize their content um, because people are transitioning from uh, print to digital subscriptions, which aren't as profitable. It emphasizes clickbait uh, headlines and uh, stories. Uh, and it makes it much easier for um, alternative viewpoints to um, get out there. I mean, it's, it's, uh, if you're not published in the National Review in, say, 1975, I, I mean, where do you go? Um, you could go right for the John Birch Society magazine, but they have a much smaller uh, publication run. You could, you could mimeograph something yourself, I suppose, but it's, it's much harder to get uh, content out there. Whereas today, uh, it's, it's incredibly easy. Um, and then finally, the, um, the one institution that could conceivably claim to function as a gatekeeper for conservatism, Fox News, has been a major uh, driver of radicalization for about 20 years. Um, so I think, I think those are some of the key distinctions between you know, now and then. Um, just the media landscape has transformed uh, uh, so dramatically. But the other thing I'll add to that is that there's always been an element of the apocalyptic in um, even in even in sort of highbrow intellectual magazines like National Review. There's oh god, if we don't stop this, then there's going to be state socialism, and uh, you know with with Medicare and whatnot. And you see that uh, that tone become much more uh, hysterical in other publications and among activists. Um, 
by the 2000s, the racial concerns that have always been a part of uh, the American conservative uh, tradition in the 20th century become much more pronounced because of the prospect of, of demographic change. Um, you know, if you read the fact that the fact that uh, white, however you define that Americans are, will, you know, in a couple of decades be the minority, that that becoming a real possibility. Right. Right. Things. And then, well, and, and then you could, you know, with the election of Barack Obama and then the sort of explicit threat to that racial order, um, I think that that, I think that that explains a lot about why this happened now, um, or not, why this happened in the 2010s as opposed to in the 1960s, the sort of uh, victory. Or even of, the 1990s. Uh, yeah, yeah, the victory, the victory of uh, far-right populism. Um, because, you know, one of the things that I, I um, am always fascinated by uh, whenever I, uh, you know, particularly a sort of audiovisual uh, piece of evidence from the 1960s is just how white everything is. And, uh, you know, obviously that's deliberate. It, the other views of America are excluded from uh, major media publications, uh, major media outlets. Uh, but it's also a country that is still, I believe, something like 80 percent, you know, white ethnic um Possibly even ninety. I forget the precise. Uh, I forget the precise uh, numbers. But it's it's a much more uh, racially homogenous country in the nineteen sixties than it is in the twenty two thousand in the two thousand tens. Um, and obviously, for people committed to that vision of America, um, yeah. racial change is profoundly threatening and a radicalizer um, in a way that, yeah, white racists were concerned about the about the dismantling of the segregationist state. But they weren't actually concerned about losing political power uh, in the yeah. same way that I think is the driver today. Yeah. Oh, well, it is a wild world. Well, I, I, I think we have probably uh, uh, taxed our viewers and listeners' uh, attention enough. Um, I'd love to chat more. Uh, this is certainly a whole lot of other dimensions to this we could talk about later. But uh, thanks for coming on uh, uh, people can follow you on twitter at david now did you misspell your own name or i think i think i needed to leave a character off because i i hit the limit i i, I made this twitter account before <laughs> i thought i before i knew i was actually going to like build a right. reputation on twitter <laughs> so right, right. Yeah, it's at but, david aston a-s-t-i-n <laughs> right right david aston walsh uh, and, and you were, you were a good tweeter, I have to say. Uh, um, so I would encourage people to follow you and I'm on Twitter at William R. Black. Uh, and is there anything else pe- people should know before we, uh, end our converse- conversation? Um, uh, you know, let me, uh, well, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make a plug, uh, I would just encourage uh, people who are, you know, were interested in the conversation, who were interested in these clips. There is a wealth of material uh, available online uh, if you just scratch the surface. I mean, it's a uh, YouTube uh, can be problematic, um, but you can find a lot of a lot of very interesting old clips and TV shows. And um, you know, this is, I mean, these are the pieces of evidence that that historians use when we when we write and research and argue. And so, if you want to. So to get your hands wet in in what that's like um, and engaging with the past, um, it's a great resource. All right. All right. Well, thank you, David. Uh, you have a good day. Thank you. It's my pleasure. All right. All right. Bye-bye.